And I really use the Sandman in some way to persuade reluctant comic book readers that the comic book has literary value. So it's funny that you brought this one in because it seems, um, I would say that the, the Sandman in particular seems the most lit uh, obviously literary of, of all the comic books that I teach in, an, in the sense that it seems to be very aware of its own place in a tradition of fantastic literature. The narrative around Thermidor, which both talks about the um, French Revolution and the moment of the terror during the French Revolution, but starts attaching that to the story of Orpheus through the, the, the um, severed head um, of Orpheus. We don't at this point in the story know why that is. Uh, this story in particular I've used to raise questions about violence and fragmentation in comic book images, the, the pattern of images around beheading, the way that the um, Isolated panels focus on close-ups. The um, story turns around a, a singing head, the head of Orpheus that's um, thrown among the decapitated heads from the guillotine and it makes its way out of them. And it also has to do with the end of the terror. Gamers and the tree creativity in the Sandman, which is very interesting, which is the rule-bound quality of, of, of uh, uh, bargaining, transacting with the gods that all the stories take as their theme in some ways. That's a, a, a motif that I, I follow in all these stories. And the way that for me is tied also to thinking about literature as a game, reading as a game, reading comic books as a kind of game, but not a game that's a free-for-all, a game that has that's rule bound, like a genre. A genre has certain rules that we follow, we, we agree to abide by the rules. It's a certain kind of contract and the story I use as an opportunity to talk about, but the story also has references to Christopher Marlowe's Dr. Faust, just as I'm um, pointing to it, there's the um, supposed the, uh, the discovery of a lost book by Marlowe, which is the merry comedy of the redemption of Dr. Fa um, Faust, so it's the kind of dream inverse of um, Marlowe's actual work. So this one sort of speaks to students, especially in literature classes. August has the same quality. It's it's a story from the, uh, the Roman Empire. Um, it The story is about the Emperor Augustus, so there's a, a coincidence between the historical figure and the period. And the story uncovers some kind of foundational trauma for Augustus. But in common with many of the other stories, the story raises issues about limits uh, both uh, time limits, but also spatial limits. It has uh, the story in particular has to do with themes about the limits of the the reach of the Roman Empire, and empire actually is a theme in this particular collection that I find very compelling and very uh, relevant in a number of different contexts. The um, question about America or the identity of America, America's democracy versus a, an empire posed by the, the fictional emperor of. of, of San Francisco or the Emperor Augustus in this story. You see another emperor coming up. Um, Soft Places is a story about Marco Polo. Um, uh, conceptually, I think um, Gaiman here is very close to what the French philosopher Gilles Deleuze described as smooth or striated places. And smooth places are like the soft places, they're in between places, get lost. Um, striated places have, have a meaning uh, to be made of them. And this describes a, an, an encounter outside of space and time in the desert between Marco Polo and a less, less well-known British writer, uh, G.K. Chesterton, who's been a big influence on um, Gaiman in particular and has a connection to fantasy literature, um, amongst others. Then you get the story of Orpheus, which is a very straightforward kind of comic book recreation of the, the myth of Orpheus. It does, however, give us the different figures of the um, the immortals, the, the kind of pantheon of, of immortal figures in, in game and dream, death, desire, despair, delirium, and so on, destiny uh, across the page. This story in particular uses the myth of Orpheus to talk about rule-bound um, conduct, the, the kind of rule the, uh, the Orpheus can retrieve Eurydice but cannot actually look back on her, which we see illustrated here in a sequence of, of images with art text. Um, interestingly enough, he's, he's descending to the underworld. We see uh, uh, Pluto and Persephone, I forget what exactly they're called in the story, and then we see the ascent of um, Orpheus and the disappearance of Eurydice, and then the story itself ties into how it is that um, Orpheus gets to be dismembered by the Vacantes and how it is that his head is severed. 
He's also, as we find out, the father of um, the Sandman, the eponymous Sandman. In the Parliament of Birds, it's a story that connects for me to the kind of um, patterns of storytelling in the hunt. This is a story that tells the the myth of humankind through the, the Adam and Eve story and also uh, revisions of that story through the uh, presence of the figure of Lilith and it frames it by a sort of an instance of non-human storytelling how a, a, a collection of birds would tell here we see the, the images of creation so spoken of humankind um, uh, the, the uh, Lilith herself in the story tells the story of Lilith and you get the sort of different female figures and then we, the story also plays with different modes of visual representation we get the kind of quote-unquote uh, realistic mode that's used to depict the, the uh, mythic uh, uh, originary story of the creation of humankind and then we get the kind of um, a naive mode to depict the story of the, the, the brothers fighting with each other. From, interesting enough, the pantheon of comic books, but they also refer to Cain and Abel in the Bible, these two quarreling brothers, but you get a different visual style for each um, narrative go around. I would in uh, a past talk a, a lot more about the actual images. Here I'm sort of interested in larger themes and thematics and narrative structures. And then it's a really exceptional work by Neil Gaiman for me is, is his story Ramadan with the uh, work by P. Craig Russell I also use this to raise questions about stylistic control sort of authorship in the comic book form where uh, sometimes the writer isn't the, the, the visual artist and the visual artist isn't the writer and what happens in that kind of mode of collaborative production um, P. Craig Russell is, a, is a visual artist or a quote-unquote illustrator whose work has a kind of signature stamp. He's done his own set of adaptations and he's very much associated with a highly decorative, really visually elaborate style, um, lots of decoration on the page, you know, rich colors, this, uh, a fairy tale look. His work is, 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 is visually akin to 19th century um, Western artists like illustrators like um, early 20th century illustrators like Arthur Rackham or Edmund Dulac, people who've illustrated the Arabian Nights, which I guess is what ties into the story. This is ostensibly a story that begins as a, as a kind of Orientalist quote unquote narrative about um, um, the Caliph of Baghdad. Uh, the Caliph in the, the uh, Tale of a Thousand Nights and One Nights is told by Scheherazade and he wants to preserve his the, 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 the wonderful, uh, literally in every sense of the word, fabulous empire of, of, of the, the, the Caliphate and he has to make a bargain again with the, the God of Dreams. We see a full page layout with the sort of gorgeous colors, the origins and purples and um, kind of um, pastels in between so the sharp sort of color contrast and range we see in all of this all the, the uh, fabulous fantastic uh, hybrid figures like this this masked female figure is kind of part animal and part human but the um, uh, uh, caliph contracts with a figure of dream in the story to preserve the beauty of his empire eternally and so he, he agrees to that that condition but he finds out at the end that the story that this means that a reversal happens and that his empire can preserve, be preserved eternally, but only as a fiction. So in reality, it loses its luster and his, his Sarai will sort of turn the page and the story makes much of the turning of the page as we follow the sequence, we go from this kind of really lavish and opulent layout, giving an overview of the legendary Baghdad to the increasing images of sand, this kind of verbal visual pun on sand man, the kind of um, disappearance here and then the kind of uh, movement across pages is, is very interesting for me not just because from left page to right page but across um, the right hand page to the next left hand page you get the sort of movement across here the magic carpet that sign of sort of orientalist fantasy is lost it's 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 simply a kind of threadbare rug and then when we turn the final page we see in a slightly different style that we're in Baghdad in the early 90s after the first Gulf War and that the story has been told by an, an, an old man to a young boy as a way of explaining why there, there's this famine and destruction during the, the month of Ramadan and it's, it, it's, an, it's, a, it's a compelling story I think that talks about the relationship between myth and storytelling and the